All attendees are in listen only mode. Hello everyone. Welcome tonight to our first of a two part series on uh, brachytherapy. So tonight, uh, Dr. Stephen Frank from uh, Professor and Deputy Division Head, as well as Medical Director of the Proton Therapy Center at the UTMD Anderson Cancer Center will be talking about LDR brachytherapy. And then uh, one week later on November 21st, we'll have Dr. Gerald Morton uh, talk about HDR brachytherapy. So I'll turn over to Dr. Stephen Frank to uh, uh, talk to us about LDR brachytherapy. Well, thank you, Karna. And I want to thank also uh, Shannon and, and Robert for helping facilitate this and giving me the opportunity to come and present today on what we're doing with prostate brachytherapy and what's happening within the um, community right uh, today. I'm going to try to put this together. This is, I want to start off by saying my, the, the title of my talk is Bending the Slope of the Brachytherapy Curve. And I think this has really been a focus of the American Brachytherapy Society um, over the last several years and moving into the next few years. And I'll try to explain how some of the technology and the advances of utilizing brachytherapy, and I'll be focusing on low dose rate brachytherapy for this talk today, while Dr. Morton will be focusing on high dose rate um, in, uh, in next week. Just for some disclosures, I'm currently the chairman of the American Brachytherapy Society. I have several NIH and CI grants. Um, I'm also the founder and director of C4 Imaging. I will be disclosing some of that technology, but it is all FDA approved and not experimental or investigational. So in order to, you know, to bend the slope of the break ether curve, there's going to need to be several different processes, and we'll talk about where the slope is currently. First, we have to define what the slope of the curve is, understand and communicate the value, um, define the price, precise dose delivery, show how brachytherapy can be incorporated into scientific discovery. Uh, I should just demonstrate where we are with medical simulation and how the importance of multidisciplinary cancer care teams with alternative payment models is important. So these are some of the areas that I'm going to be focusing my talk on today. So where are we with the slope of the curve? If you look at this slide, you can see that prostate surgery um, has increased since 2001 and 2002, while brachytherapy, we've seen a decline uh, since that time. And so it's almost uh, just completely my mirror images of one another with respect to what's happening to brachytherapy. If you look at the brachytherapy boost, it's also decreased, but I think these are areas that we have the opportunity to improve. And this is all based on the National Cancer Database of approximately 1.6 million uh, patients. If we look at the SEER database, we're seeing something uh, similar. This is data that looks at external beam radiation and brachytherapy. And, and that's all brachytherapy. And then if you look at brachytherapy plus brachytherapy and external beam, again, you're seeing the decline of it, whereas you're seeing an increase in utilization of external beam radiation, primarily with IMRT and the technologies around that over the last, the last decade. So how about monotherapy and then brachytherapy with a boost? So the top slot, the top uh, image represents what's happening with monotherapy, both in, uh, in high, intermediate, and low-risk prostate cancer disease. Uh, you can see with the low-risk patients, we are seeing a decline, and we're seeing a steadily decline, and a lot of that is because of active surveillance. If you look around the brachytherapy boost, we're seeing a decrease in utilization in intermediate-risk patients, um, and, and, and more specifically, the slope is, is a more negative slope across the board as we start looking at monotherapy uh, in these intermediate risk patients versus brachytherapy boost. And then we can look at the change in proportion of patients given the brachytherapy by the hospital type. You can look at it in the academic, the uh, comprehensive, uh, com the community setting, all of which demonstrate that there is a substantive decline in the number of cases and number of patients with access to brachytherapy. And even in this healthcare system today, when we are looking to improve value, 
it we're still seeing a decline in probably the highest value proposition for prostate cancer patients, hospital systems today. So we will we will talk a little bit more about that during the during this during this talk. If we look at academic and non-academic centers, the trend is pretty similar. External beam is on a rise and brachytherapy is on a decline. This is a great article. If you have an opportunity to read it, this is written by Dr. Peter Wright, uh, myself, and many of our other members of the ABS. And it's brachytherapy, where is it gone? And um, and, it's, and I think it's, if you get a chance to read that in the JCO, I think it's it provides uh, some nice commentary to some of our thoughts around that. But ultimately where we need to start is how do we communicate what is the value of brachytherapy? Should we be continuing to do it or should we move away from brachytherapy and just focus on external beam radiation? So this is some data that is published in the British, British Journal uh, International of Urology International. And basically what this, what this represents is the compilation of every manuscript published on the outcomes of prostate cancer treatment by treatment type. And this has been accumulated by urologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, spearheaded by Dr. Peter Grimm, um, who, is, who has subsequently passed away. And what the aim of it was is to look at the data that's currently published. Each number you see represented represents the reference to the publication. And the size of the dot represents the volume of patients that were presented in that publication. Each of the spheroids are then generated to look at percent PSA progression free and the maximum follow up in terms of number of years. And these studies had to have a minimum of 100 patients. So these are the, the what's been out there. And what you can see is that brachytherapy can consistently will demonstrate superior PSA progression-free survival. And what's even more impressive is that the publication and duration of outcomes extends beyond 12 years, whereas most of the other publications, including surgery and even external beam radiation, we see the 10-year data, um, as you can see. And this is for low-risk prostate cancer treatment. So as we move to intermediate risk prostate cancer treatment, what we also see is we see that brachytherapy alone still has excellent long-term follow-up data. And then what we also see emerging is this external beam plus the seeds, which is the purple uh, spheroid, which also demonstrates high PSA progression-free survival um, out long-term. So here's what the published data demonstrates for intermediate risk disease. And then if you look at comparative analysis for patients with high risk disease, you also see that for external beam and seeds, it continues to demonstrate high PSA progression free survival, especially when you start looking at the surgery data. And we have to also remember that most of the surgery data is post-surgery pathology which typically represents an upgrade of that disease, uh, both in Gleason score and typically within the context of extra capsular extension. Whereas what we find with brachytherapy is we're looking at data that is clearly the preclinical, the pre-treatment. Uh, um, and we also see the emerging use of external beam seeds and androgen deprivation therapy as trimodality therapy as well. This is an important data set that has just been published in the, in the Red Journal this year. It might be one of the most important publications that has come out from a randomized trial. And what this publication is from the BC Cancer Agency, which has a very high quality brachytherapy as well as external beam, is a randomized trial looking at a boost of external beam radiation versus a boost with brachytherapy. So both of these arms, one went to 78 gray, which is what we're currently using at MD Anderson as our standard two gray per fraction in 39 fractions. And then the other arm, and both arms had gone to 46 gray at two gray per fraction, followed by an implant 
boost in one arm versus external beam in the other arm. No hormone therapy was incorporated uh, in these particular patients. Um, and as we aim, um, I'm sorry, the, the androsuppression was included in these particular patients for one year. And as we look at this, when you start looking at the surgical definition and the threshold for failure, what you find here is that the patients who have external beam with androgen deprivation therapy boost, what you find is a 20% biochemical no evidence of disease at nine years versus 80%. I mean, this is astounding differences in outcomes, which really the aims to demonstrate that a boost with brachytherapy is the, is the ultimate form of dose escalation and allows for more persistent disease control than using external beam as boost alone, even with 12 months of hormone therapy. And if you look at the absolute difference, what we see is 50, is almost 40% at five years, 43% at seven years, and 48% at nine years. And this is, uh, you know, from a curve and from an outcome standpoint, it's extremely impressive. At the same time, we have another phase three randomized trial that's also been uh, just, published, just uh, presented through the RTOG. This is the randomized trial 0232. Uh, this is on intermediate risk patients with the goal of looking at external beam plus an implant boost versus monotherapy. And the preliminary outcomes from this study uh, that was presented by Dr. Brad Presage, who's the PI, demonstrates no difference if using external beam with a, uh, with a boost versus doing monotherapy um, in this particular trial. I also started a trial here at MD Anderson, and it's now in press in the Red Journal, on a 300 patient phase two trial of monotherapy for intermediate risk localized disease. And the monotherapy was iodine for 100 patients, palladium for 100 patients, and cesium for 100 patients, all monotherapy. This, the, out, the toxicity portion of that trial and outcomes has just been accepted in the journal of brachytherapy. The, this trial is in press. And what we were able to demonstrate is a five-year biochemical, and this is monotherapy alone, no evident, no hormone therapy, and no um, external beam, but demonstrated 98% biochemical failure-free survival at five years and a progression-free survival of 93% at five years. Uh, the median follow-up was 5.1 years, and the median PSA at five years was 0.1 nanogram per milliliter. We had one death due to prostate cancer out of the uh, 16 follow-ups. And what we also aim to demonstrate is what the true costs would be in terms of treating someone with brachytherapy. And this is something that we've been really aiming to pioneer and utilize, which is time-driven activity-based costing. This costing methodology has really come out of other industries and is now emerging into healthcare through the work of Dr. Bob Kaplan, who's a Harvard a professor at the Harvard Business School, and additionally incorporated into work with Michael Porter in uh, value-based healthcare. But what this ultimately does is allow us to understand where all of our costs are in each step of the process of quality assurance through the entire cycle of a patient's care. And the importance of this is that it then allows us to look at those percentage of cost and then find ways to further reduce cost by either adding advanced technology, which improves processes, or by becoming more efficient um, through our treatment. And so here you can see that 40% of the costs are just derived from being in the operating room. And what we've also enabled through work with uh, Bob Kaplan and, and, and Michael Porter is to generate a method to communicate value. So what you see in front of you is a radar plot. And on this radar plot demonstrates survival and disease control, which is in orange, the costs, which is in purple, acute complications from surgery or radiation in green, 
and then you have patient reported outcomes that are in blue and anything that extends further from the center of the axis represents better outcomes or lower costs. You'll also note that there's a dotted blue line around the patient reported health status that is comparing baseline to one year after treatment um, for the patient reported outcomes. The disease and survival are out at five years as well as the acute complications and if we look at the cost you can see as a reference point here's what brachytherapy can offer patients their healthcare providers and then what we can ultimately do is overlay other modalities on top of this to help patients and providers to determine what's the best value for their for their um, patients so here's an example here we looked at at our institution brachytherapy, proton therapy, and robotic prostatectomy for intermediate risk patients. And what we were able to, to demonstrate by using this radar plot, just by looking at patient reported outcomes and costs, is that clearly the costs of brachytherapy are significantly less than what we would expect to see in robotic prostatectomy or, or uh, proton therapy. But for patients, they might look and say, if you know, if you're 50 years of age and they see that there's the protons on the sexual function are proven to be better than robotic prostatectomy, it might guide them towards spending a little bit more of their resources to be treated like that. Um, and that may be true as we look at urinary continence, where we see brachytherapy and proton therapy actually doing and not, not really having incontinence, whereas Surgery is still a little worse, but then we look at urinary bother and we see the brachytherapy is a little worse, which we've noted. And we also note that uh, the protons here, as well as surgery, have less urinary bother, a bowel bother. We see the robotic prostatectomy does best, but the protons does worse. And so what this can help with is in the decision-making process and also potentially for value-based determination and reimbursement. Um, as we consider bundle payments down the road. What we have done here at MD Anderson is extend the utilization and improve quality in brachytherapy by, by incorporating better technology through MRI. And while many look at MRI as a increasing cost utilization to a procedure, what we have demonstrated is less cost because we're able to cut out elements of the workup and the procedure with utilizing MRI in simulation, treatment planning, and post-implant assessment. And I'll be just speaking a little bit more. And so this issue, this is a special issue edition that came out in the spring of 2017, which went over the utilization of MRI in HDR and LDR prostate brachytherapy. It's the first time they've ever put a picture image onto the front cover. Um, and this was in the edition 16.4 which came out in July and August. So precise delivery dose. Why does, all, why does this matter? This matters because if you look at quality assurance and brachytherapy, there had been a fall off over the last several decades that was really popularized through this New York Times article that came out uh, and, and really opened up people's eyes to what was happening to brachytherapy at the uh, Pennsylvania VA and the Philadelphia VA. And what you can see here is two of the procedures in which patients not only failed but had major complications. And one patient had their penile bulb implanted inappropriately. And then you can see right here all these incorrect placement of seeds um, in this particular, in these particular cases. And the congressional oversight started to investigate this and, and found that the poor quality resulted in major complications and poor outcomes in these patients. So I'll stop for just a moment just to give a little bit of what this is. This is a painting by Paul Rubens of the goddess Thetis dipping her son Achilles in the river Styx, which runs through Hades. And you can see her holding his heel as she's dipping him into the river Styx 
because she was told that he was going to die in battle, and so she was trying to immortalize her son. So what I'm going to talk about is the Achilles heel of brachytherapy and why and what we have done to correct it. As you look here on this slide, this slide represents prostate imaging using ultrasound, CT, and MRI in post-implant uh, assessment. The ultrasound on the left upper column is the base. The mid-gland is the next column, and then you can see the apex. And this is a standard ultrasound images. If you look at the CT, these are standard CT images. You can see what it looks like at the base, the mid-gland, and the apex. But you really can't see where any of the anatomy is located by utilizing CT, which is the metric that we are used to help us define the quality in which we've delivered our treatment. Post-implant assessment and dosimetry is critical um, because the procedure is not over until you've evaluated your quality. And the two things, the two reasons you need to evaluate the quality of what you've delivered is number one, if you haven't delivered a high quality implant, you may need, you may need to take the patient back to the operating room to add a few more seeds to optimize the treatment. And number two, what you can learn from that implant, you can improve for your next implant. So post-implant quality assurance is the critical step in, in quality assurance in, in prostate brachytherapy. And if you look at the bottom, you can see optimal imaging on the MRI at the base, mid-gland, and apex. And you can also see where the external urinary sphincter is located at the center of the apex, um, which is not prostate. However, you can't tell that on ultrasound or CT. But the problem is, is that as you look at the MRI, all you see is these negative signal voids, so you can't localize where the seeds are under MRI. So that makes it difficult to do your post-implant dosimetry. So we set out to develop a tool that would allow for post-implant dosimetry to be completed by utilizing MRI to optimize quality assurance. And we developed a marker, a positive contrast marker, that is placed between the titanium radioactive seeds. And this is what you can see in this ex vivo canine prostate with the TI, meaning titanium, dummy titanium seeds. And then C4 represents a cobalt chloride complex contrast agent that was developed here uh, at MD Anderson. So diagnosis to response assessment, MRI is now utilized in every step of the process. A PSA rise is confirmed, MRI is used to diagnose, biopsy is, is utilized, the diagnosis will help determine where the dominant lesion is located, is there extra caps or extension, is there seminal vesicle involvement, and is there disease in the lymph nodes. MRI simulation can be utilized by a, an additional sequence added to the diagnostic sequence so the patient doesn't have to go to the MRI twice. And then that image can then be pulled in for treatment planning, can be utilized for cognitive fusion or real-time fusion in the operating room, still with an ultrasound-based implant, meaning utilized almost like a DRR. And then we take the patient to do MRI post-implant dosimetry and then monitor with MRI uh, surveillance and PSA monitoring. So why MR? Why MRI? Because here you can see where the prostate is. The prostate's very clear. You can identify the pubic symphysis, the bladder, and I think what's important is to look at the bladder neck between the bladder and the prostate. Most of the time, even with external beam, you can't tell even on a CT scan what the difference is between the bladder neck and the prostate, and we commonly treat that entire neck uh, inappropriately as a margin, um, but we can avoid doing that with, with MRI and, and brachytherapy planning. The other important structure is obviously looking at the urethra and what I want to highlight here is the distance of the urethra from the rectum. If you look here that's only about three to four millimeters and so when you potentially run the risk of causing too much dose to the rectum you can get an ulcer and if the patient develops some rectal bleeding and hasn't had a colonoscopy before their implant to verify that there is no cancer there, then the patient might 
succumb, succumb themselves to going to a gastroenterologist who would then look, see a rectal ulcer, may mistake it for consideration that this is a, a cancer and start biopsying it. But as he starts to biopsy it, that needle can transfer up into the urethra, resulting in a fistula that is non-healing, and then the patient will end up with a colostomy. And we think, well, maybe this, this probably doesn't happen, but it does happen. And in fact, recently I've been asked to review a case specifically where this has happened in the outside community. And I only tell this because it is important to be able to have high quality planning, treatment delivery, and assessment at every step of the process. Here we can see the ejaculatory ducts. They come into the Vermont tantum, and so that can further help localize this under, under MRI. And then this is an important structure which we don't see under ultrasound, and we don't see under CT, which is called the external urinary sphincter. And it's important because this is simply a muscle, and the urethra is in the center of it, but it's a one centimeter diameter structure that under ultrasound we think is just prostate, and so we give it full dose and implant into it. But this is what's driving a lot of the urinary bother symptoms because you're putting seeds in high dose into a muscle that is controlling urinary function. So by looking at MRI, we can then identify this, we can plan around this, uh, and optimize our treatment planning process. We can also look at vessel sparing radiotherapy to aim to preserve erectile function. This is interesting you know, manuscripts looking at utilizing MRI to help with this. And I think Dr. McLaughlin has done a phenomenal job from Michigan to really help clarify where many patients' anatomy is located, and we see a lot of differential anatomy um, utilizing MRI. And I think one of the key things here is if you look at the external urinary sphincter, that is in light blue, Patient to patient, this could be very different. And the surgical data has already become aware of this, and they identify that patients that have longer external urinary sphincters have a better rate of continence than those that have a very short one. Um, you can also see the internal pudendal arteries um, as well as the accessory with the neurovascular plexus to help potentially avoid sexual uh, uh, impotency. Here's another example. This is was also published in there on MRI. You can see the difference in length of the external urinary sphincter adjacent to the penile bowl. The blue represents the prostate, the green represents the penile bowl, and what's the red is represents the length of the external urinary sphincter from the apex of the prostate to the penile bowl. And it just shows that these variations can be predictive uh, of potency. We also see here the an example of the transitional zone, further evidence, you know, at 25 millimeters versus 1.2 centimeters, and then that's inside the prostate, and then as you go outside it, you can see 1.3 centimeters and 1.7 centimeters. And then we can look at the variation neurovascular bundle. We can see where these are located in some patients, where they're located in, a diff in other patients. Some patients that are around, the body of the prostate. This has been commonly coined as the veil of Aphrodite in some popular nomenclature. But what you can see here is that there, this might be on top right of the prostate where the radiation margin is going to affect, and that will be able to further help communicate to the patients what those expectations are following treatment. Here is some further data, both from patient-reported and physician-reported outcomes for the absence of erectile dysfunction using sexual aids or moderate to high confidence to get and maintain an erection. So you can see this with both androgen deprivation therapy and no dep androgen deprivation therapy out to five years. So what is what is MARS? What is MRI-assisted radiosurgery? And I point this term, and we've now published on it, to, the, to describe utilizing a surgically ablative approach to achieve a PSA consistent with what we would expect following radical prostatectomy. It's five o'clock. And 
what we would be aiming to demonstrate is that we can treat the intraprostatic dominant lesion and ablate the prostate utilizing brachytherapy um, in a radiosurgical approach. So I'll describe a little bit of that. Here we have diffusion-weighted imaging to help us further define the local, local location of where the dominant lesion is located. This is hypertense signal on DWI. You can see the hyperintensity is, is initiated by restricted diffusion. Um, and you can see on the DWI that this then lights up. If you look at the ADC maps, these ADC maps will show a negative contrast. Uh, and this is multiple diffusion weightings with quantitative um, estimate. And these tumors tend to be hypo-intense on ADC compared to zonal anatomy or benign prosthetic hypertrophy. And we are going to have to ultimately become more comfortable with understanding and communicating about MRI. There is a, a nice review of the obstacles, opportunities in order to learn about the utilization of MRI, MRI. And there's about 15 articles in the most recent brachytherapy journal that I encourage you to review because it walks you through anatomy, uh, uh, MRI, all of uh, for the radiation oncologist, and really the terminology and bringing yourself up to speed because MRI is going to be an important part of component, not just of prostate cancer, but all of radiation oncology. And then we look at DCE. This is vascular density uh, and it, its impact uptake rate. Tumors tend, tend to have a larger uh, vascular density, and that's the rapid wash in. Uh, malignant lesions tend to have a rapid wash out uh, phase. Um, and then that can be identified and noted to help further elucidate where these dominant lesions are uh, for dosimetric planning. You also have MR spectroscopy, which is looking at ratios between the citrate, creatine, um, and you can look at vascular, you can look at voxel overlays on T2, which can further help in multiparametric imaging. And this is another example of just when they, people talk about multiparametric analysis that's using T2 weighted ADC maps, DCE, mass spec. So a lot of the information can be utilized to help clarify where disease is located that is dominant versus maybe some non dominant, insignificant uh, biopsy specimens. And so the power of MRI is being able to utilize all these tools to better appreciate where signal escalation or dose escalation should be utilized uh, to optimize the care of our prostate cancer patients. So when we think about MRI-assisted brachytherapy or radiosurgery with MARS, really it's the opportunity to ensure that we know where the dominant lesion is, we surgically ablate it, radiosurgically ablate it, and then we aim to alleviate and minimize the dose to the additional structures around um, and achieve the same PSA control rates. Here's an example of a biopsy confirmed recurrence six years after an implant. And this is on column A. You can see where a CT post implant dosimetry just showed where an isodose line, but the V100 was 97%. So, for all intents and purposes, that would indicate this patient had received a high quality implant and really should do very well. And then post-implant, what we were able to do when the patient started having a rising PSA was to go back and utilize a multi-parametric MRI to identify where the recurrence is located. We biopsy this, and then we went back and did re-radiation with an implant where there, in fact, was disease, and that patient has now no evidence of disease. So it's a, it's a mechanism where we can utilize MRI with multi-parametric imaging post implant and then utilize that information to better plan our, our treatment if a patient chooses a non-surgical approach. So what about what why do we need to utilize MRI? It's not just about getting better information on the tumor, it's also about eliminating dose to the normal tissues. The external urinary sphincter as I as I alluded to earlier was virtually unknown to us. 
And we looked at, we've done patient reported outcomes on every single patient that we've implanted since 2005. And what we met, went back to look at is we looked at the anatomy, we looked at the patient's outcome, and then we looked at the DVH associated. What we found was that the external urinary sphincter was causing irritable and bothersome symptoms when you achieve these doses over 240 gray. And that patients reported pain or burning with urination, even 40% of patients, even up to 18 months. We also see with the internal urinary sphincter, bother, urgency, and irritable can occur even at 35 gray. So in order to maintain optimized function, we need to monitor the internal urinary sphincter and keep the high doses of radiation and the heterogeneity off of that urethra. So this provided us some, in, some information and data that would suggest that we could improve further patients' outcomes and urinary outcomes by minimizing dose to this external urinary sphincter. So these are the different sequences that we started to utilize and are utilizing today for diagnosis, for simulation, treatment planning, and post-implant assessment. What you see in green is really more of the diagnostic side in, in, the, radi in the radiologist. What you see highlighted in the yellow to orange is what the sequences that we're using for radiation planning. And in light blue, that's what the urologist will tend to utilize if they find the need to do MRI guided biopsies. So medical simulation. We've developed a tool and a technique here to allow for every resident to have their own phantom when they come on my service. And what that allows for residents to be able to do is learn every step of the quality assurance process without having to touch patients. Now, of course, all of our residents do touch patients, but what we wanna make sure that they have available to them is typical to what we would do for aviation community, which is to have a simulator. And so we've created a virtual simulator where residents can take their phantom, they can image their phantom, simulate the phantom, perform contouring treatment planning on that phantom. They may get dummy seeds that are stranded. They implant those, they do post-implant assessment, and through that process, they're able to learn every step of the quality assurance process. We've also been able to utilize new technology that's allowed for us to use a novel coil design that then can provide high quality images that are consistent with what we would expect to see in the operating room. So in the upper left hand, I, I we did a study here where I looked at the standard endorectal coil that is used for diagnostic purposes. And what you can see is it drastically inflates, expands the rectum, and causes deformation of the prostate. And what we found was these, these images could not be used for treatment planning purposes because you couldn't reproduce that image in the operating room. A new coil has come around that is utilized uh, at our center, which is a Phillips-based coil that has the same diameter as the ultrasound probe. So when you stick it in for patients during the diagnostic, it captures images of very high quality that can be used for simulation treatment planning. And then we have the treatment planning systems, which we can do virtual simulations on now. And what we can do is we can take the probe because these patients are have their legs down during the MRI while their legs up during the implant. And what we did was we calculated using basic trigonometry what the angle would be for patients' apex down during MR imaging and then up when they're in the dorsal thotomy position. The base doesn't move much. And what we found was just by looking at the opposite over the adjacent and doing an inverse tangent, we were able to identify the angle that then we could use as a virtual simulation following the MRI scan. And that's what you see here. And then you can actually overlay the, the grid which can then be utilized for next um, for simulation and then treatment planning. Here's the contours 
of, of the patient, both the CTV and the PTV. The CTV is in blue and the PTV is in light blue. And then you see another structure, which is at the apex, that's the external urinary sphincter. And I think what's also interesting to highlight is that you can see some of the prostate actually, for many patients, actually moves posterior a little bit further than at the anterior portion of the gland. And so we can now optimize the treatment plan specifically around that. Here's the MRI utilized uh, for treatment planning. As we start to do the treatment planning, you can see here where the seeds are placed. You can look at the isodose lines, and you can see very clearly that you have planned a very high quality implant with substantive heterogeneity, but that's okay. And we look at different heterogeneity with iodine, palladium, and cesium, and we want to minimize that heterogeneity along the urethra uh, pathway. And then during the implant process, you can take these images. This is an MEM treatment planning system, and you can overlay what you're seeing with ultrasound with what we've planned with MRI, because it's always nice to walk into the operating room with a plan. It decreases the amount of time that you're in the operating room. It decreases the costs. And then when you get there, you already have the ability and if you find something that you might want to optimize further, we utilize intraoperative optimization and have these images up on a screen. And if we feel that we need to add another seed, we can do that, which is demonstrated and highlighted here in the middle of the prostate. Again, intraoperative optimization allows for us to do this planning real time in the operating room not for the purposes of doing the entire plan, but to come with, come with a plan, and it decreases the stress for the implant team. When we do post-implant assessment, again, we use the MRI. We can see clearly where the localization of the prostate and the anatomy are so that we can do adequate post-implant assessment. These are the serious MRI markers that are placed as spacer, as functional spacers, this is, has the C4 solution in it. And what it does is it allows for a bright contrast to be revealed inside the prostate that will then facilitate the localization of the radioactive seeds under MRI. Here again is another example with a blo more blown up view, but you can see the white markers that are there inside the prostate. This would help facilitate, if you look on the upper right-hand image, you can start seeing in the periurethral, these are just marker, 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 because we don't generally place seeds along the entire length of the urethra up in, in adjacent uh, proximity. And if you look in the lower right, you can see where the marker is between the two seeds, and so you can accurately place the seeds for more precise post-implant assessment. Here's what the isodose lines look like. Um, I call them radiosurgical isodose lines because they're like a knife. I mean, this is a virtual knife that is around the prostate to facilitate ablating the gland and the cancer. And this is actually the cover image that we find on the Brachytherapy Journal uh, that was published in August. We've looked at early quality of life outcomes. This was just presented by a Dr. Faroki, one of my residents to show what these outcomes for MRI-assisted radiosurgery or prostate brachytherapy are even out to eight months, and shows the AUA score at baseline is about six, and roughly about eight at um, eight months. What about patient satisfaction? If we look at one month, four months, and eight months, we have over a 90% overall satisfaction rate at four months, about an 88% overall satisfaction rate, with over 90% of these patients extremely satisfied. So incorporating MRI can improve outcomes of brachytherapy by avoiding the external urinary sphincter, improving urinary sexual and patient satisfaction. You can consider the nerve vascular bundles during planning, and you can incorporate MRI to treatment planning to manage the dominant intraprostatic lesion, which really drives the biology. 
this December, in a few weeks, we have a unique workshop that we're doing for the first time. And what we're doing is we're bringing physicians and physicists together as a team in order to be able to learn each step of the process for implanting an HDR and LDR brachytherapy. There's a half day of didactic and then a, a full day of simulator implants. We'll have 16 faculty, again, 32 teams from around the world. Uh, and this is up in Chicago, and this is all paid for by industry and supported by industry. So this is free to those that have applied for it. And we hope that this will be a success and we'll continue to do this uh, in future years. What about, so what's the next step? Why is this, is, is this where we can go? Well, it's not, I think it's just the beginning. If we think about the immune response, one of the interesting notes of the phase two trial that we did on intermediate risk patients is we had no nodal failures. And one of the hypotheses that I have is that as we, as we ablate the prostate, that, these, that this therapy induces a stress, and those th that stress causes therapy-sensitive tumor cells with dying tumor cells and antigen release, which is engulfed through immature dendritic cells, then mature, and then that grows into the immune T cells that drive into microscopic potential disease that may be in the lymphatic channels. And with brachytherapy, we will not cause a loss of those T cells as we would expect to see perhaps in the external beam when you've got beams that are coming in and wiping out your lymphocytes. And we know through surgical data that 15 to 20% of these intermediate risk patients should have positive lymph nodes, but we are not seeing failures. So this provides us an opportunity to incorporate immune, immune modulators, um, anything from uh, PD-1 uh, to other type of check inhibitors. So I think it's an exciting an op wide open field where we can use brachytherapy as the prime for inducing systemic immunization. So here you're priming with energy. This could be the radiotherapy and push with immunotherapy with immune checkpoint inhibitors or T cell agonists. These are all opportunities for clinical trial development and utilized with brachytherapy, especially in high-risk patients as we start thinking about trimodality and incorporating androgen deprivation therapy and external beam. But to have run a good brachytherapy program, it really requires a multidisciplinary team, an integrated practice unit, and we have a very unique one, a, a team that we've come up with, with urologists, our medical oncologists, our radiologists, our um, dosimetrist and physicist. And this is the kind of team because ultimately it's going to require a, this whole team to help facilitate taking care of the patients. How will brachytherapy continue to expand? Perhaps one of the mechanisms is also the alternative payment model. Because if we get a bundle payment and we're able to choose whatever modality that is best for the patient, and then able to keep whatever we, we get in return, then the then brachytherapy, which is the lowest cost treatment, could really find an opportunity to achieve a better margin for the healthcare system without compromise in quality, outcomes, and, and minimize the risk of, of complications. So we can see for low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, these are different type of bundles that we could consider, you know, as you escalate the risk, we start escalating therapy more, uh, and you would then add a different bundle for each of these uh, profiles. The bundle would be covered services through diagnosis and workup, covered services for treatment, and covered services for follow-up to one year, and then consideration out in survivorship. 
So we can bend the slope of the brachytherapy curve to use radar plots to communicate our value. We need to be able to tell the surgeons what our value is. There's a recent publication that just has been, that's just come, just come out in British Journal of Urology, which demonstrates our quality of life outcomes with surgery, robotic, with nerve sparing versus brachytherapy, and really shows that the sexual function is worse, the incontinence is worse, patient satisfaction is worse, and that is prospective data, data collected here at MD Anderson, and using the radar plots, it's a very effective communication tool. Incorporate MRI into practice. This is gonna be a part of your practice. It's, it's, we're just evolving. We're really, we've got now uh, three, access to three MRIs in our department. And so the more that we start to embrace and understand the terminology, the techniques, the access to MRI, this will expand and improve your, your practice. We need to advance the science. We need to design the next generation of brachytherapy trials. Utilize medical simulation. Integrate your practice. Try not to be a solo practitioner out there, but truly demonstrate and show your data. Um, payment bundles will help bend the curve. And I encourage you all to be active in the ABS. We now have committees that are assigned that allow for residents to be part of multiple different committees. Uh, it's free for residents to participate and be part of. Um, and that gives you access to the journal, and we're looking at ways to sponsor further and in incorporating some leadership opportunities. i like to just acknowledge the team here at MD Anderson. Uh, it's really a true village and, a, and an honor to work with all of these clinicians and scientists to expand our access and quality of care to our patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that great talk. So uh, we have, uh, so if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Frank, uh, please just ask in the question box. And uh, so far we have one question. Um, so right now residents receive breaky experiences in residency. And then uh, do you think that residents should have better standardized breaky therapy training during residency or should this be done in post-residency fellowships? Then? You know, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I think that um, currently the RCC has not done brachytherapy uh, um, a real advantage, meaning you can leave your residency training and never do a prostate implant. And you can go out in the community and do it, and it really is not, you know, whereas even in gamma knife or in other procedures, you've got to do a minimum of 10 of those, or 15. So right now, the requirement for interstitial experience is five cases. And as long as you do five cases, which we know is not, which we know is, is inadequate. So my recommendation is if your, if your group is not, and your residency is not doing brachytherapy, find an institution. The, the ABS has multiple of institutions that are teaching institutions around the country and up in Canada that would love to have residents to come for a month. Uh, generally, that one-month rotation can at least give you all of the tools to understand the process of quality assurance. Um, I've just I've trained three different residents uh, who are now faculty at varying institutions. It generally takes roughly about you know five to seven months to feel confident that you can do brachytherapy alone. So the conceptual framework around fellowships, I think, is a is a reasonable one. They do that now up in Canada. Everybody that is going to go into do brachytherapy has to do a brachytherapy fellowship. We have not fully evolved into that here in the States, um, but likely should. Uh, you have Memorial has a brachytherapy fellowship. Um, we are developing one here at Anderson, but I think that we've tried to create these workshops and, and these tools to help people get up to speed by using phantoms and also, we are willing to have the faculty at the American Brachytherapy Society come out and proctor your first couple cases. And, you know, I had, I had my mentors do that for me. And I think it's a, it's a way to help bridge and get you confident and your team confident um, for those first few cases. So uh, maybe, uh, do you have any advice for someone who's starting new in a brachytherapy, you know, setting to kind of, 
maybe develop a program or, you know, uh, maybe they already have a program, you know, what advice you would give them? My, yeah, my advice, if you're aiming to start a program, is to, is really to get buy-in initially from your, your physicist. I think you really have to get your physicist and dissymmetry team agreeable. Um, if you're in a private group, you have to have the support of your group, meaning you have, need to have an, uh, have an appropriate imaging access, which would include utilizing, I think, MRI and finding ways to incorporate MRI into your practice. I think you need to have an outstanding ultrasound unit. If you get into the operating room and you don't have an ultrasound unit to place these seeds, uh, or it's a bad one, then it's just going to frustrate you. Um, and there needs to be a communication with the hospital system as to what resources they have in terms of radiation licenses for radioactive materials. Um, we're going to have a checklist that's going to be coming out following the workshop that is going to help people really do a, do a box check and reach out to the vendor. Um, to help facilitate their their support, that'd be true with uh, for a, for LDR consideration of starting out with iodine and palladium. I think uh, cesium probably gives a little bit more um, rectal symptoms just acutely, um, and we've gone on to publish that and show that from a patient forward outcome standpoint. But I think all the isotopes can be used and used effectively. Um, but that would be my initial advice to getting up a practice. I think you need to, to buy a couple phantoms. Uh, we're looking at ways to do that through some uh, novel technology um, that can allow for you to take your MRI for that particular patient, take it, and then have a model made up uh, of that particular of that particular prostate and then practice on it before you go to the operating room. So there's a lot more technology that's coming out today. Um, for your treatment, do you use uh, Flomax for all patients post brachytherapy or only for like, symptom control? So I start all my patients on Flomax two weeks before the implant. I sort of a bit, it's sort of like a primer for me and gets patients used to using and trying it. I do uh, one tablet at nighttime at 0.4 milligrams. And then I escalate that usually around 30 days if it's a palladium implant because that's generally two half lives and 75% of all the radiation is delivered at that point. And then I aim to come off of it within four months, taper off of it. Um, if a patient's really struggling, I would give maybe an additional one in the morning. So I, I don't, I don't uh, you know, stop at just two if, if I need to add it a third in the morning. Um, but what we have found is that that's, that regimen really gets people on and off within, you know, within uh, three to four months after the implant. How about, I know for... Um what if an institution doesn't have an MRI or, you know, have only limited capabilities or doing MRI? What would you recommend for those type of institutions or what type of imaging would you consider? Yeah, that? yeah I mean, I think, I think you'd have to use ultrasound-based imaging, you know, and what you can do is I would encourage you to, to do a simulation of a patient um, in the treatment position in your clinic if you can. If you can't, you're going to have to do that in the operating room um, in, a in a more real-time virtual fashion. But you need to give yourself time because you, what you don't want to do is feel rushed. Um, rushing tends to cause more mistakes. Uh, it increases the stress of the team. And so the more that you can do outside the operating room, the better. I do think that everybody has access to an MRI today. I think MRIs are universally accessible. Um, you just need to go and, and meet with your, your, uh, your radiology colleagues. Um, the diagnostic MR is standard of care. And then you can just add a 3D T2 sequence uh, as an additional sequence. We've demonstrated and communicated that in the publications. And that would then be used um, to be pulled in your treatment planning system as your, uh, as your simulation and planning uh, MR. So while, you're, while your department uh, of RADOC might not have the MR, MRs are, are very accessible. And I would encourage you to move that way because then it allows you to maintain that high consistent quality of post-treatment evaluation um, and then it, it just makes your program and your outcomes for your patients better. Um, what are your thoughts about 
uh, selective, like boosting, you know, nodules with, you know, we have the MR now and targeted biopsies, but doing like selective boosting and or, um, you know, fusion, fusing your MR with your ultrasound if you can't get it at the time of or get a pre-treatment, uh, a pre brachytherapy MR. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, that, uh, let me make sure I, I, I hear your question. Your question is asking me, about boosting, like uh, now, you know, with the MRI, you can get where the tumor nodule is, like boosting that area. So just also, a, not 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 in it, not a standard boost, but just boosting, almost like a focal boost. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, so I think these are things that are currently happening right now, and people are ex exploring. We don't have a specific protocol yet that will address just the dominant lesion, um, especially in some of these active surveillance patients. But I do think that we selectively ensure now that we start to contour these dominant lesions and make sure that they get 200% of the prescribed dose. Um, that's the beauty of brachytherapy is you can really uh, novelly escalate that dose right in the tumor, um, which is really, uh, which is really uh, very cool. And I, and I have to say also that of all the things that I do in radiation oncology, Every time I walk out of the operating room, I recognize that that was that doing brachytherapy is fun, and there's not many things that we do as radiation oncologists that one could just walk out and go, "That was really fun." Um, so I I think it's just an added, you know, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be un, unnoticed that this that the the skill sets around brachytherapy and the satisfaction of treating and curing. Uh, a patient through a process that can take roughly only about two hours from the time that you meet the patient to one year of follow-up after it. It's really, it's really an extraordinary uh, tool in our tool chest. All right. Thank you, Dr. Frank, for answering those questions. So uh, this ends our webinar for tonight. And as a reminder for next week, we'll have the HDR session. Um, so please attend if you can. So thank you. Thank you again for us. Uh,